Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. A couple years ago, uh, Love 146 came to church and kind of filled us all in on the statistics and this horrible crime. And, you know, I think immediately we both just kind of felt uh, compelled to want to do something. I heard about human trafficking in the news and, you know, you kind of automatically think about labor and, you know, immigration and stuff like that, but not the, the child sex trafficking. Uh, when we realized how big of an epidemic was and we're just sitting in, in the middle of it, you know, how can we not do something? How can we not take some kind of action? When people first learn about human trafficking, when we first learned about it, most people, um, as our friend Tammy said, she just wanted to go like learn Kung Fu and go break down doors and go Navy SEALs on people, you know? But uh, you, you learn pretty quickly that there's a role for everybody uh, in the fight. We can say, God, what are you calling me to do? Uh, how have you resourced me? How have you equipped me? And then we can follow uh, hard after him in doing those things. It wasn't until you know several months later that I was sitting back in church, uh, right in the back of Faith Bridge, um, during the middle of the service, uh, when it kind of hit me that I would combine my passion for endurance running um, with this passion to want to make a difference. We always kind of joked about running across Texas like it's our home, and that's a that's a long distance run or what have you, and and. That day, he was like, I, this is, you know, the Texas Freedom Run, that's what, you know, this is what we'll do. You know, I wanted to help kind of spread the word and educate people on the problem. I wanted to inspire people to take action, and I wanted to raise money, um, you know, for, for this organization, Love 146, that was doing such an amazing job. So total, it's 850, just over 850 miles. Um, and we started at uh, El Paso, and just continued down I-10. I finished the last day right there at the the bridge uh, between Texas and Louisiana. The crew really consisted of uh, my neighbor that lived across the street from me, who was an ex-HPD yeah. officer, and uh, my brother-in-law, who's a photographer. Um, and so this skilled team set out to do this uh, unbelievable endurance feat, 30 marathons in 30 days. So needless to say, it was, uh, it was a rough month. Um, you know, I ended up rolling my ankle on day five. Um, dark up, day. Very dark day. Um, you know, it took a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, the community, our Facebook fans, everybody came on board and was praying for us. Um, you know, there were many nights uh, going to bed, um, you know, tired and hurt, uh, missing my family, feeling alone. And the more I started thinking about these children um, and having the encouragement of everybody on Facebook and that accountability, it just um, just helped each mile kind of start clicking away and making it possible. It was just unbelievable. Uh, total, we raised right around $60,000. Well, I can honestly say that this is the first time that uh, I think Amber and I both went all in. You know, we, we've talked about this before where we really felt like we sat on the sideline, um, you know, getting involved. And we wanted to do something where we were just completely immersed. And so to take this month, um, I can say without a doubt that you know I felt the presence of the Lord more in this 30-day period uh, than I have my entire life. What was so cool about what Jason did in running across Texas is that he uh, looked at uh, what God um, had done in his heart, how God had equipped him, the business God had put it in, the physical um, pain that he could endure, and then he just went hard after that and he used uh, those giftings to raise money and a, a lot of awareness for Love 146. And so each of us can do the same. We can just say, God, what have you, what have you made me to do and how can I come alongside uh, Love 146 and other organizations to fight child trafficking? You know, I had a very kind of off the charts passion for running um, that I coupled that with another passion to want to make a difference. Um, and so I think that's something that we could all do, right? We can all find some little trait that we have, some skill, some passion somewhere in our lives and say that doesn't have to be reserved just for us. How can we put that to work for God's glory? And, and we just saw a lot of blessings in doing that. So we're, we're firm believers and we're, we're all in now. <laughs> Amen to that, huh? That's awesome. That's good stuff. 
Welcome. Glad that you're here. If you're here in Center Court East, if you're here in Center Court West, if you're here at the Woodlands campus, welcome. So glad that you're here. I've been really looking forward to today because uh, for a good while we've had lined up this series that we're calling Salt and Light. And in it, um, we thought it would be appropriate to hear several voices that are just pushing back the darkness in the name of Christ with light. Um, and today you're going to get to hear a f fascinating, fantastic example of that. Rob Morris is the president and co-founder of this organization that you were just seeing uh, sort of mentioned in the video, Love 146, which is uh, committed to abolishing uh, child trafficking and exploitation. And he's got a very powerful word uh, for us in just a moment. Let me mention this first. As you might imagine, the nature of the subject today is such that if you've got little ears sitting beside you and you're not ready to go into, so what is that and how does that work and why do they do that and, and, and that sort of thing, this would be a dandy time for you to take advantage of our fantastic kids ministry. And so you've got about a minute or two to run out and get checked in and slip back in and um, we'll be s starting up then. So I just wanted to just kind of mention that to you. Uh, I think that's all really that I needed to say beforehand. Let's welcome Rob Morris to Faithbridge. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, good morning. How many of you are ready to run across Texas? Yeah, me either. I, I'm just, uh, every time I hear Jason's story, I'm just absolutely astounded uh, to the degree that when I love that whole understanding of I'm all in and what that actually um, means. I want to thank you um, because Faith Bridge has been all in um, with us now for some years. It was a couple years ago that I was here last. Um, and because of you being all in, your generosity um, in supporting our work uh, has just been enabling us to do some amazing things. Since the last time uh, that I was here, we've opened three new locations for survivor care. Um, one uh, for boys in the Philippines, because this is an issue that does affect boys. Um, we also opened uh, a survivor care home in the UK, and then we also began doing survivor care here in the US. Um, and also, not only the survivor care piece, but also doing prevention work, because we don't want to just continue to build safe homes and shelters for children that this has happened to. We want to stop this from happening uh, to kids. And so we've developed a prevention education program that is enabling us to go in specifically here in the United States um, to s public schools, to detention centers, to um, areas where there are children at risk, um, and, and educate these kids, enabling and, and equipping them to be able to prevent it from happening to themselves and to uh, their friends. Since 2010, um, we've been able to reach a little over 16,000 young people in the United States, over 7,000 of them this, just this past year alone, many of them being right here um, in Houston, Texas. Um, and that's because of your radical <laughs> generosity and support. In fact, it was because of your initial engagement a couple years ago that we were able to um, open up a new office in the United States right here. Um, in Houston, enabling us to reach uh, the city of Houston. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for uh, your support. You know, and, and I, love, I, love what J I love how Jason says in that video, he's like, I took something that I was passionate about and I connected it to this issue and was able to take my passion and do something significant uh, to change the issue. And so uh, we don't, people sometimes, hey, do I need to become a law enforcement officer to break down brothel doors? Do I need to become a social worker? No, do what you love to do and find ways to connect it and you can make um, a huge difference. Um, here's a couple of things I want to throw up here of practical ways that you 
can be involved. Again, what we do as an organization is we're working to end the trafficking and exploitation of children. If you're like me, I was given the impression when I was in school that slavery ended with something that we call the Emancipation Proclamation. The reality is that slavery is alive and well today. There's estimated to be over 20 million people currently in slavery, many of them being women and children, and in some of the worst imaginable forms um, of slavery. We're working to stop that from happening, and we're caring for those that it has happened to. But here's some practical ways if you want to continue to partner with us. We have, by the way, some tables out back. If you want to talk with us afterwards, we'd love to be able to chat with you. Um, we, we are looking for monthly partners. The sustainability factor is huge in the work that we do. And our partners who come uh, deeper with us that say, hey, we want to be able to help sustain the work on a monthly basis have been just phenomenally helpful um, in the work that, that we do, not only being able to support it, but also encouraging us um, along the way. If you're a person who prays, hopefully uh, this room is filled with uh, those kinds of people. I, in fact, this morning before um, uh, the service, I had your, you have a prayer team that ambushed me um, and said, we want to pray for you. And I was like, whoa, okay. Um, you should have seen them coming towards me. It was actually a little intimidating. Um, and uh, just what do, you want to, what do you want us to pray for and stuff? And man, that is such a crucial piece of, um, of, of enabling us to do what we do and do it well. And so we covet your prayers. I'm always blown away when I come to a church and sometimes I'm approached by somebody who says, man, I've been praying for you for the last eight years. I pray for you, your family. I pray for the work of Love 146. I pray for the children that you serve. And I had no idea that there, and I just never get to hear that. And so this is a way that you can actually stay in touch with the work that we're doing. If you're a text savvy person, um, you can text the words Love 146 to that number up there, 411247, and that puts you into our prayer realm where um, once or twice a month, we're not going to bombard you with tons of texts, once or twice a month we'll send you a text of, hey, this is a prayer need that we have right now. Sometimes it's an emergency thing, and we have this beautiful group of people who just go for it and pray, and we see really cool things happen. Sometimes it's just a celebration thing of saying, hey, because of your prayers and because of this work, this is what we've seen happening um, in this particular child's life or in this particular work. So, man, we could really use that. If those of you that want to go even deeper under mobilization, sign up. We, we are launching task forces in different cities and different areas of people who want to be boots on the ground, getting involved with working particularly in your area, your neighborhood, your city, um, your town to end the trafficking and exploitation of children because this is something that happens here. It's not just something that happens over there. So thank you again for your work. It is so good to be with you on a lot of different levels. In fact, yesterday when I left Connecticut, it was four below zero. And so when I landed, yeah, tell me about it. When I landed here yesterday, it was like, oh, it was just wonderful. So um, I don't know what I just did, but it sounded kind of operatic. Um, anyway, so it's really good to be um, embraced with your warmth. Um, so thank you for that. Matthew chapter 14 is a really familiar passage of scripture. Uh, one that we've heard often, mostly because of the radical miracle that takes place in Matthew uh, chapter 14. And you know how like in your Bible you'll have headings or headlines um, over specific chapters and everything? And it's just like you see headlines in the news. It's sort of a headline because something sensational. It sort of picks out the sensational thing or the radical thing that happens within that passage of Scripture. And in Matthew 14, in most of our Bibles, you'll see the headline is the feeding of the 5,000 because it's such a radical physical miracle that takes place there. But oftentimes, just like in the newspaper, sometimes the headlines, especially sensational headlines, can somewhat eclipse some of the other beautiful things that are happening along in the rest of the story. And so this morning, I really wanted to concentrate on some of the other things that are happening in this passage outside of the radical physical miracle of feeding um, 5,000 people. In this passage, in Matthew 14, something horrendous happens to John. And it's so interesting because of even the time that we're living in right now, we're seeing this happening in the news. Jesus gets news that his cousin, his friend, John, um, has been brutally murdered. He's been beheaded. 
And you know how even just watching the news lately and seeing some of those same headlines in the news, the impact that that has um, on us as human beings, seeing that sort of cruelty, that sort of terrorism, well, this is what has happened to John. He has been beheaded. And you see the impact that it has on Jesus here. It says this, after he gets the news that his cousin John has been brutally murdered, it says in verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Now, to understand the impact that this news has on Jesus, I think we have to understand a little bit about the relationship between Jesus and John. We all know that Jesus and John were cousins, but I think that they were really tight. There was a deep, deep connection between Jesus and John, even so much so that before they even met each other, before they even took their first breath, there was this deep connection. Do you remember when Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John, was standing in a room, and Mary, who is now pregnant with Jesus, walks into the room, and you hear this famous exclamation that we all know. When Elizabeth looks at Mary, she says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby within my womb leaped for joy. What a beautiful picture of this deep connection between Jesus and John that before they were even born, the, uh, before they were born, the unborn John is leaping for joy in the presence of the unborn Jesus. Such a powerful and beautiful depiction of that relationship that started even before they took their first breath. We have no idea what their childhoods look like, but maybe if they were like us, maybe they had family reunions and John and Jesus got together as the cousins all got together. Maybe they had sort of inside jokes at they shared and childhood uh, boy type games that they played together and stuff and secrets that they shared. Who knows what their childhood looked like? But we saw this connection follow them through right into their adulthood when you see, um, you know, John giving shout outs about Jesus saying, man, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. And Jesus saying, man, no one born among women is greater than you. And there's this connection, this depth And so we can understand a little bit more why Jesus is reacting to this news the way he is, the impact that this has when the disciples come and say, Jesus, your cousin, your friend, that one that you've known before you were even born has been brutally killed. And how does Jesus react to that news? Just like any of us react to horrific news, to absolute heartbreak. He says, man, I have to just be alone. You guys, I love you, but I just got to get off. I need to go be by myself and find a place where I can just grieve on my own. Some of us in this room, many of us in this room, can understand and relate to that depth of grief where it's just like, man, I just need to go someplace and grieve. I just need to be by myself. And, you know, I love, you know, we have these things, what would Jesus do, what would Jesus do? I love that what Jesus would do here is the same thing that any of us would do. At the sound of horrific and the, and, and the news that we get that something horrible has happened to a loved one. You know, I think sometimes we have an easier understanding or an ability to grasp that Jesus was fully God than we do that he was fully human. And I love here we see the picture of Jesus being fully human in his grief and his heartbreak saying, I just need to go and be by myself. And so Jesus takes off in the boat. The only place he can be by, by himself, he takes off. And then we see what happens next. And this is where it gets really interesting. It says, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. So here are John's disciples, here's some of Jesus' disciples and everything, and we know by by what it says in this passage, it says we think that there were 5,000 people in this crowd. That's a large crowd of people, right? This crowd, hearing that Jesus was wanting to be by himself, can you imagine the audacity of the people in this crowd? It's like here's he's getting the worst news imaginable, he wants to be by himself, and them hearing of that wanted to get to him. Right? And so they're trying to figure out where Jesus' boat is going to land. And what's so interesting is that this wasn't just 5,000 people. We think that it's 5,000 people because of the headlines. But if you read this passage, it actually says there were 5,000 people, not including women and children. Meaning that there are 5,000 men in this crowd, but including women and children, Bible scholars estimate that there was probably close to 30,000 people in this crowd. You guys, that is a stadium full of people. 30, picture this scene on the shores of that lake. 30,000 people trying to figure out and maneuver to where Jesus' boat is going to land and they want to intercept him there. 
What a scene taking place. Imagine just the dust storm created from 30,000 people moving as one giant mob along the shore trying to figure out where Jesus was, was heading, and Jesus in his own grief and heartbreak. Um, and so when I started thinking about 30,000 people, what kind of people do you have in a crowd of 30,000 people? And in particularly, this crowd of people who were some of John's disciples and Jesus' disciples, and some were just curious. And I started thinking about any crowd of 30,000 people, but this crowd of 30,000 people, who was in this crowd? And I actually wrote down a list of the kinds of people I think you would have found in this crowd. You would have had the brokenhearted, the sick, the depressed, the hopeless, the suicidal, the hungry, the abused, the poor, the cured curious, the needy, the oppressed, the excluded, the hungry, the exhausted, the confused, the isolated, the devastated, the despairing. I mean, these were desperate people all clinging possibly to the last shreds of hope, some of them even having to be carried by their friends because they couldn't even physically walk. This crowd of 30,000 people represents the mass and mess of humanity. If I lived back then, you would have seen me in that crowd. And probably most of us in this room would have found ourselves also in that crowd of desperate people, all trying to intercept Jesus. And so picture this mob of people and what was happening there. And here's where it gets really fascinating. It says this, as the crowds followed him on foot from the towns, Jesus landed, seeing the large crowd, He had compassion on them. What is that? Okay, if you're like me, the last thing you want to see in your place of deep need is another needy person. Am I right? Let's be honest here, right? If you're in your own place of heartbreak, in your own place of grief, the last thing you want is somebody, I need, I need, I've got this going, I've got this. You're just like, hey, can I get a minute to myself? You have no idea what I'm feeling right now. You don't know what I've been through and everything. And you want something from me? Please give me a breath. In fact, if that was me in the boat instead of Jesus, it would have been an all-day-long chase where I'd be heading this way and the crowd would be moving to intercept and I'd turn the boat and I'd go back that way and the crowd would have to go over and it would be all day long going back and forth, but not Jesus. What is, what is this thing called compassion? It says he had compassion on them. In fact, several times, at least 12 times through the New Testament where it talks about Jesus having compassion, it actually uses this statement. He was moved with compassion. The word moved there insinuates some sort of action attached to it. He didn't just feel compassionate. This is way beyond feeling some sort of sense of pity. There's an action attached to this to the point that the action for Jesus meant I'm actually going to move toward the mess of humanity. I'm actually going to go move toward the objects of compassion instead of away from it. What kind of compassion is that? What is that? In his own place of heartbreak, in his own place of grieving and need, he's moving. And it's not like Jesus was surprised when he ended up on the shore and like, whoa, what are you guys doing here? I wasn't expecting you. He would have seen a crowd of 30,000 people moving as one along those shores. And he purposely moved toward them. It, that passage has so gripped me. I'm like, what is this? This is beyond pity. And so I started digging a little bit into the word compassion and I found some really interesting things. This is not some passive pity thing. I think sometimes we sort of dilute words like compassion. We use them so flippantly. Hey, man, have some compassion. Why don't you have some compassion? Compassion, compassion. And it's more of like in the realm of pity, but there's something much deeper here. And so I started to dig into this, and there's a lot of different meanings to the word compassion, especially in the New Testament. But there were two particularly pertaining to this passage that really struck me and jumped out at me. And And they're basically this. The first one The word compassion here is derived from the Greek word for bowels or intestines, the deepest part of a human being, the gut, if you would. It's the place where reverse peristalsis or um, uh, um, basically nausea, the churning that creates nausea, comes from that place. And so the word compassion has its roots in this word um, for that place, the gut, meaning that what's happening here is the sight before Jesus, the insanity of what's happening on the shores, the mess of humanity actually um, makes him sick makes him want to throw up. It's a gut wrench of like, ah, he looks on the crowd, his gut is wrenched, his heart is torn wide open at the reality of this is not the way it's supposed to be. 
Have you ever felt that? The gut wrench when it comes to the craziness and the madness of what's happening all around us? Some of you have felt it when you open the morning newspaper and you see the stories getting more and more horrific and there's this gut wrench, this, ah, this is not the way it's supposed to be. You watch the evening news and you almost have to jump across the room and shut the news off because it's getting too violent, too crazy, and there's this, ah, and this is where we get the word sickening from. When you make that statement like, oh man, that is just sickening. It's the gut wrench. I felt it the first time years and years ago, over 12 years ago, the first time that I was standing with criminal investigators, undercover investigators, about to go into a brothel on an investigation where children were being sold in this brothel. I remember standing in that room as we walked in, looking through these glass windows at young girls with matching red, number, red, red dresses and having even the dignity of a name stripped from them. They just had numbers pinned to their dresses, and I'm standing on the other side of the glass, shoulder to shoulder with predators who are purchasing these kids for absolutely horrific and unimaginable reasons. And there was this, uh, this gut wrench inside of me. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This is a child. This is somebody's daughter. This is insanity. That's the birthplace of compassion, that gut-wrenching. Like, uh, I felt it again just a couple um, months ago. I was actually on my way to a speaking engagement on an airplane, and, and I remember opening up my email, and I had just received an email from our director of aftercare in the Philippines who had emailed saying, we just brought the youngest child that we've ever brought into our care just two years of age. Did you just hear that? Did you hear the audible gasp in here, that Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That is the birthplace of compassion. It has to start with that gut wrench of this is not the way it's supposed to be. A two-year-old, come on. What has happened? This is the madness of humanity, of what we have become. And here's Jesus moving toward it. I'm going to immerse myself in that mess with this thing called compassion. So compassion is the birthplace, is that gut wrench. But here's what gets really interesting, is there's a second meaning to the word compassion as it's used in this context, in that it comes from the Hebrew word for womb. The place where a laboring begins to take place until it gives birth to something new, new life. So not only is Jesus' gut wrenched and he's sickened by the sight before him, but he allows that gut wrench to move into a laboring till he brings forth something new in the mess and the madness of what was represented as humanity so that people who had no hope are seeing hope for the first time. People who were utterly and completely feeling alone are now literally spending the day with Emmanuel, which means what? God with us in the mess. People who thought that God was untouchable are now physically being touched by him. People who were hungry are now being fed. People who, who were literally broken are being made whole. There is life being birthed through compassion in the mess and the madness of humanity because compassion went its full extent, going from the gut wrench into a laboring, a bringing forth of something new so that the sight wrecks Jesus to the point that the same muscles that make him want to throw up and get sick actually turn into labor contractions, bringing forth something new. Such a powerful scene happening on that hill. I think this is what happens with us. When I, I feel challenged when I read this of feeling like, wow, do I fall short in this kind of compassion. Oftentimes, we're even afraid to go to the first place of compassion, which is the gut wrench, because you know what? I got enough stuff of my own to deal with. I got enough of my heart, my own heartbreak, my own grief, and it's just crazy, crazy, crazy. I can't even imagine. I've, I've seen it happen when we talk about what we do. I'm honestly, I'm like the dinner guest from hell, okay? When people, hey, we'd love to meet you. We'd love to have you over for dinner and stuff. And you know what happens in those places. So Rob, tell us about what you do. I'm like, oh my gosh, there goes dinner. Because nobody wants to hear about this kind of thing because it's the gut. It's like, ah, this is too painful. It's a very difficult charity to even raise support for because most of the time people want to run in the opposite direction. That's why I'm so encouraged by people like yourselves who say, you know what? Actually, we want to know and we're all in. It's, you cannot believe what that does for us. There's a courage involved with that, and there's a courage to wanting to know. So I think sometimes we're afraid to even go to that first level of the gut wrench. We end up retreating into our own stuff. We turn inward. We distract ourselves, sometimes even numb ourselves with busyness, entertainment, gadgets, even sometimes medication because, man, I don't even want to go there. 
So it takes courage to even allow ourselves the gut wrench. But I think it's honoring to God, and I think it's also honoring to those that need to know that compassion actually um, exists. So I think in going beyond that, I think this is, this is where it gets really interesting. There's a guy named Henry Nowen who wrote this about compassion, and I think it's really beautifully said. He says, compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion, and here's gets, this is so beautiful. Compassion means full immersion into the condition of being human. Isn't that what God has done through this thing that we call the incarnation? Fully immersing himself into the condition of being human so that hope and compassion is even possible. And so God requires us to do the same thing, not just to be passive recipients of his compassion, but man, to be engaged in being that conduit of his compassion to those who are all around us day in and day out. And so we have to move beyond the gut wrench to a place where we allow that to turn into a laboring and we end up bringing forth something new. And man, laboring is not pretty, right? I, I have six kids and my, my four youngest we've adopted, but I was at the, t- at the birth of, the t- of my two oldest kids. And I'm telling you, being in that laboring and delivery room, it was crazy, okay? It was like, it was messy, and it was beautiful, it was painful, and it was full of joy and wonder. It was this mixed bag of all of that stuff together. Wouldn't you just love to live a life where we could just eliminate the mess and the pain and just do the joy and wonder stuff? That's not real life, right? That's not real life. And so immersing ourselves into the whole condition of being human, compassion is birthed there. And, and when I think back, if, if we had gone into that brothel over 12 years ago and I just allowed the gut wrench to stay there and didn't allow it to begin to turn into something laboring, that two-year-old girl would not be in our care right now and getting her childhood back. You know, and I think about that there was a thing, this organization called Love 146 was birthed out of a laboring that was birthed out of the initial gut wrench. And so we need to take it the full length, the full way of compassion. You know, if, if we just stop at the gut wrench, if I stopped at the gut wrench that first night when I walked into that place and just walked out in despair, we never would have had the Love 146. It would have just been like, oh man, this is sickening. I'm despairing. It's hopeless. It's too big of a situation or whatever and everything. But we allowed that gut wrench to turn into a laboring, and that's what changes the equation. And when we allow ourselves to be moved with that kind of compassion, hope invades despair. Peace ends up interrupting violence. Light ends up dispelling darkness. Love ends up triumphing over hate, and justice prevails against injustice. It's exactly what you just heard Pastor Ken talk about. It's the salt and light in the mess and madness, and that's what changes everything. And you guys, in closing, you know, in, I've been following Jesus for 30-something years, and one thing that I have learned beyond a shadow of a doubt about God is that he is a God who moves toward us in our brokenness. I don't know where you're at today. There's some of you in this room that I know, guaranteed, that you find yourself in that crowd even right now. I'm the isolated. I'm the lonely. I'm the grieving one. I'm the brokenhearted. Um, I'm the broken, you know. I'm the confused. And, and, And you find, man, I'm in that crowd of people. I want to tell you the truth of the gospel is that God is not afraid of your brokenness. God is a God of compassion who actually moves towards you in the mess and the madness of what sometimes looks like um, our life and then requires us to do the same. And when we do, anything can happen. And, and I want to end with this um, video of one of the girls that has been, he, she was in our care for some time. She was reintegrated back into the community and she really wanted to tell her own story. And I love it when, I mean, this is, this is the reality. We want um, the children that we work with to tell their own stories when they want to and how they want to instead of us telling their stories. And she was really determined, I want to tell um, my story. And, and when you watch this, her name is Remy. 
and Remy's story is unfinished. It's continually being written, right? This is just like all of our stories. She has good days and bad days. She takes two steps forward, one step back, just like any of us um, in, in this room. So this is not like a fairy tale ending, everything is gray, okay? This is her real life. But I want you to pay attention to a couple things when you watch this. Is first, I want you to feel the gut wrench, and you probably will in the beginning as she tells what has happened to her. Um, don't be afraid of that. Embrace that gut wrench and then watch what happens as you see her story begin to unfold and, and the work that compassion has wrought in her own life. The whole beauty from ashes that ends up happening because of a people of compassion who are demonstrating the compassion of God in the way that Jesus demonstrated that compassion on the Sea of, of, of Galilee that day. And, and so I want you to pay attention to her story and how compassion relates. And, and one of the things that triggered me at one point, somebody mention this to me, I didn't even notice it, but in this story you'll see that there's this, um, uh, she makes a statement about her traffickers. She says, I was hungry and they fed me. Speaking about traffickers, that's not a trafficker's job, that's our job, right? Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. And so it was very challenging when I heard that. And when you also watch her story, I want you to also pay attention to the reality that because of your support and your generosity, you have actually helped write her story. And because of your ongoing support and generosity, you are helping us to continue to write the stories um, of countless children today, tomorrow, the next day after that. So thank you again from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity, for your support, and for your all-in mentality. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, and I'm here with Brian McGowan. We just heard a great message from Rob Morris of Love 146, and he educated us today a little bit about what they do to fight human trafficking. And I'm here with Brian because Rob had to get on a plane and head back before the weather got bad, but we are lucky that our own Brian McGowan sits on the board for Love 146. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. And thank, thank you for being here to answer some of our um, questions today. You know, Rob spoke a lot about their work all over the world. Mm -hmm. The survivor homes, um, we heard a great story from a survivor in the Philippines. Um, can you speak a little more specifically about what Love 146 is doing here in the Houston area? Yeah. So about two years ago, uh, when FaithBridge started a Love 146 task force, was, was a bunch of Faith Bridgers say, we want to do something. And so we gathered uh, once a month as a task force, as a small group, and we'd be praying and planning and trying to bring in awareness. And uh, it was just right about then, there was this momentum here in Houston, and FaithBridge was able to be the catalyst uh, to give the initial gift to 1146 to start a Houston office. And so since that office has been here, they're in their second full year mm -hmm. uh, this year, um, they have actually done prevention education, which is going into the different schools, HISD, Spring Branch, a, a number of schools, uh, and training um, counselors and teachers and high school students even about what human trafficking looks like, uh, because it's the whole idea to stop it before it happens. And a lot of times it's happening um, to girls, uh, especially who they don't even know that they're being trafficked. They don't even know um, that they're in the midst of being coerced or um, doing something that they don't have to do. Uh, and so the numbers, even in Houston, they've trained more people in prevention education in Houston than they have even around the U.S. Um, through uh, the Houston office. And so that's their main focus right now. Uh, also bringing awareness, raising support for Love 146. Uh, they just um, started two new programs. One, which is they call the Hotel Motel um, uh, program, which they're sending um, people to go and train the owners oh, and the managers it. of mm -hmm. hotels and motels to recognize it when it's happening because there's an ordinance in Houston that it's against the law. Uh, to rent rooms for that purpose. And so um, that's one thing that they're, they're just launching now. Uh, and then another thing is that they uh, are working with local officials, um, the judges and the different uh, law enforcement for girls that are rescued from um, human trafficking. Uh, they are providing some intervention. Specifically, the girls usually would go to some sort of foster care or group home, uh, but they have nothing. And so they're providing these backpacks that were designed by survivors for what you would need in the first 
24, 48, 72 hours after you're rescued. So it has things simple like a cell phone, a teddy bear, um, uh, art, like books to just be able to express themselves. And so that's what they're doing here in Houston. Uh, and thanks to, to Faithbridge uh, for being a catalyst and, and, and making a lot of that happen. You know, he talked today about the the, the gut wrench, like the yeah. compassion, exactly. like the moment that yeah. like moves you into action. What, what was it for you? Yeah. Like, when did you move, get yeah. so involved in love? What moved you? Yeah, so for us, I'd gone to a conference uh, in Dallas and heard some speakers about it. I had no idea that it was going on. Told Jenny about it. Um, and it was that moment that we, we still didn't fully understand it. Um, and it was on a vacation of ours that we were sitting there like in the beautiful California coast and reading about it. And it was just this weird juxtaposition of we're here, safe, warm, enjoying each other's company. And yet we're reading about the, the, the tragedies and mm -hmm. just the, the craziness of the world that's happening. And so it was in that moment we knew that our, uh, we had been praying about what our um, family's mission would be. And we were, I think we were kind of hoping it would be a safer, cleaner, nicer uh, mission. Uh, but we knew in that moment that the Lord was calling the McGowan family um, to use our um, scope of influence in the world and, and to also bring up our kids to know that this wasn't right and that we needed to do everything that we could in our power um, to bring awareness and hope. Um, and I'll tell you what, every day, including today when I hear Rob's message, that gut wrench mm. is still there. Uh, and I've been to Thailand and I've seen it. And it, 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 I, it's one of these deep, dark industries um, that when you are gonna be in a ministry that's fighting it, you've gotta really hold on to the word of God that brings you hope. And you wake up every morning that his mercies are new every morning and that only in his power are, are we gonna see true freedom. Mm. So. so as a faith bridger who's sitting there feeling that feeling today and thinking we have to do something, I want to do something, how, how do I go about yeah. getting involved? Like, how uh, can It's we a help? great question and one I get asked all the time. I mean, we started a task force. It ran for about two years. We we're hoping to relaunch a task force. So hopefully if you were here at church today, you signed up. If not, you can go to our website um, and sign up and we're hopefully going to relaunch that. Uh, also, I think Jason Archmont is just a great example. Mm -hmm is a man who had a passion and some giftings to do certain things. And he just said, I'm gonna leverage that to fight human trafficking. And so mm -hmm. um, I think that's where, what all of us should do. Number one is to figure out how did God gift us and how can I use that to fight human trafficking? So if you're an attorney, maybe you look into uh, legally, how can you help? If you're a counselor, uh, connect with Love and 46 and see if you, they can use you in, in that capacity. I think sometimes we all wanna be the experts yeah. to really interact with survivors, but only a very small few are actually have the expertise and the training to work with survivors of sex trafficking. And so uh, I think for us, I'm gonna call it normal people who don't have that expertise in, in training, we just have to use what God, God gifted us to do. Um, and so get part of the task force here, um, help raise support and money. I mean, like Rob said, monthly support for, um, organizations of human trafficking is sort of the lifeblood of how they can sustain. And there are many corporate organizations, even individuals who are totally against this. They don't mm -hmm. want it to happen, but they're also scared to support it and be part of it because they feel like maybe they'll be linked in with it and, and it gets confusing and messy. And it's, a um, dark, it's a dark, dark, dark industry. And so um, I would say just jump in, you know, feet first, figure out where your giftings are and how you can be part of it. And uh, go to our website, go to loveand46.org to get more information about it too. Great. And so lastly, we saw a video today of a survivor's testimony mm -hmm. in her own words of the story. It was very powerful. Yeah. Um, if you've watched this online and weren't able to join us today, you will not be able to see that video. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah. why? So in uh, an industry like child sex trafficking, there is extreme confidentiality that goes along with that. Uh, and the story that was shown in church today was a story of a survivor who was able to actually tell her own story, um, which is, was a huge moment for the whole organization, but also for her protection, for the protection mm -hmm. of the organization, since she was actually in the video, her face, her story. Um, they, Love 146 made a promise to her that it would not be um, recorded and put up permanently anywhere. And so they, they can show it in live venues, but, but not anywhere online. Um, permanently to protect her, to protect the organization. Um, but you can go to love146.org and they have 
a plethora of vi videos that will get the same message across mm -hmm. about different survivors' stories. Um, just won't have Remy's face in there. So Great. you can go online and see those videos. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here with us. Thank you. thank you for joining us for Postscript. Join us back here next week as we continue our series on salt and light. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.